Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye, should, uh, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and Glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to preach just a little bit this evening. Thank you for what you did today and what you've already done in the service. I pray you'll bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to preach a few minutes tonight on the examples of the gospel. Now, these are, these are uh, uh, things that Paul went through, the examples of the gospel. I, I notice here that as I read these verses, uh, verses 10 through 12, we see some examples of the gospel. And every believer is to be an example of what the gospel says. After all, if folks can't see a difference in us, then why should they desire what we're offering? And I mean, to be honest, when we go out and we present the gospel to someone, we should make sure that what we're presenting we're trying to live. I mean, because we, we're, there's an example. After all, if folks see a difference in us, why should they desire what we're offering? Paul and his team were good examples of the gospel. You say, preacher, how were they good examples of the gospel? Well, number one, I want you to notice the conviction. The conviction. Look at verse number 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Paul used three words here that I believe kind of wraps this verse up that I want you to notice. That, that first word, look at it, the word holily. It carries the idea of piously, with sanctity, or sacredly, without breach. And Paul here is saying that they lived lives in a manner that was pleasing to God. Hey, could we ask ourselves this question tonight? Are we living a life that is pleasing to the Lord? Hey, after Sunday's uh, messages, last Sunday's messages uh, by Evangelist Jimmy Clark, Monday and Tuesday night by Brother Kenny, and then Wednesday night by Brother Finley, and we heard three wonderful, four, actually five wonderful messages, if you include Sunday, about revival and what God can do. Hey, can I tell you, if your heart has not been stirred, if it has not been challenged to live a life pleasing to God, if you uh, read your Bible every day and you pray every day as we should, it only promotes clean living. Now, hey, I'm thankful for forgiveness. I'm thankful that we as Christians, when we slip up, we have a God, 1 John 1, 9, who's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But folks, we should not use that and say, I can live any old way, and then all i got to do is run to God and ask forgiveness. No, that's not. That's lasciviousness. That's not really the grace of God. Friend, we ought to live a life that is pleasing to God. You know, years back, when I was, a, I guess, a teenager, maybe a kid, uh, this fad came out, and, and, and of course, I have nothing wrong with it at all, but it was, it was a fad, and it was WWJD. How many of you remember that? What would Jesus do? Now, listen, a great question. A great question. I remember Charles Sheldon wrote a book. I don't know how many of you have ever read the book, In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. Great book. And someone out of that book got that little phrase, what would Jesus do? A community, if they, they asked that question uh, and they lived that question, what would Jesus do? Hey, you know, if a church, if we got together every morning before we went to work or before we took the kids to school or before we did our daily deeds and we got in a room by ourselves and said, you know, God, would you guide my steps today? Would you guide my tongue today? Would you guide my thoughts today? Hey, may I ask the, my, the, the question today, what would you do in this situation? We would live a cleaner life. And I believe we'd be more soul conscious and gospel conscious. So Paul said that word holily. It carries the idea of sacredly or without breach. Number two, notice the second word in that verse, verse 10. Paul uses justly. Justly. Notice that. 
He said in verse 10, uh, that, uh, and, and you're witnesses in God also, how holily and justly. That word justly means in conformity to law. They lived their lives according with what was right. Justly carries the idea of being real or genuine or true. We need, a, we need a revival of realness in our churches. We need a revival of realness behind our pulpits. I, I firmly believe this, folks, that until revival breaks out in our pulpits, revival will not come to the church. Because what we have across America today is we have men that's preaching, but they're not living. And I'm talking about it, it's behind the pulpit. See, if our pulpits ain't right with God, how can the church be right with God? And I mean, we got men that they are shepherds over their congregation and they're uh, men of God. And I, I'm, not, I'm very careful to criticize a man of God. And, 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 but they are uh, men of God and called of God, many of them, I'm sure. But yet they have, they have uh, one thing, they say one thing behind the pulpit and they tell their people to do one thing when they themselves do other. And folks, that's not real. It's not genuine. It's not genuine. Hey, God is looking for realness today. People that is just real. Quit being a fake. I mean, it's, it's simple, but quit, quit being a fake. You know, the idea of faking it till you make it, I don't know where that came from, but that is not a very good lifestyle to live by. Now listen, I, I know some places that promoted that pretty heavily. Oh, just fake it. If you're having a tough time, just keep smiling through it and don't let anybody know you're struggling. I don't believe that. As a pastor, if I'm having a tough time, I want my congregation to pray for me. I'm not going to get up here and say, now congregation, uh, I love you. Church, I love you. And, and everything's always good in my life. I never have struggles, never have heartaches, never have pain. Then I would be lying. I'd be lying. Folks, preachers struggle just like anybody else. Hey, just be real. Hey, Paul was saying, be justly. It means conformity to the law. Now notice verse 10. Notice this again. Justly. And then he uses this third word, third word unblameably. Unblameably. Notice that. He says, holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves. He, he's saying uh, that this idea that no one could sustain a charge against them, they could make the charge, but it couldn't be supported. It couldn't be proven. Paul uses these words, and he says that this is how we behaved ourselves among you, unblameably. Now folks, it's one thing for somebody to accuse you of something. It's another thing for them to have something to support it above reproach we should live our lives above reproach we should not put ourselves in situations that someone could say uh, uh, this person or that person that preacher was in a place hey I've got a preacher friend right now who uh, was under suspicion I and mean, he's a good man I truly believe but he went to a place that he should not have went and someone seen him there, and they said he was doing something that he was not doing, therefore, he about lost his church over it. And this man, he come to find out that yes, he was saying the truth. He wasn't involved in anything, but it was not, listen, he was not living unblameably. As your pastor, I have to live above reproach as much as I possibly can. Now, can you avoid... Can you avoid someone falsely accusing you of something? Absolutely not. There's any one of you in here could make up something of me, and guess what? If you put it on Facebook, people will believe it. Because they believe everything on Facebook, right? That's the truth. I saw the preacher doing it. Like, 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 like. I thought you loved me. Like, like, yeah. And uh, a smiley face, heart, like, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, all that stuff, sad face, you know. And people would believe it. For you know it, the preacher gets voted out for next Sunday. Because people nowadays, instead of believing, you know, you're, really you're, you're, you're guilty until proven innocent. In today's society. Why? Most people don't read that verse and think, you know what, I should, oh, before I go there, I should probably think about what people might say. 
I'll never forget my dad told this story. I think it's awesome. Only my dad could tell it. There was a man in his church that, uh, and I remember the man. He's a, he's a good man. He's, he struggled a bit, but he, he was a, my dad won him to God and a, as far as a, to the Lord and uh, he got saved, new convert. His wife was on fire for God. This guy was kind of struggling a little bit and he was trying to disciple him in, his, in my dad's way, you know, just staying after the guy, calling him. And one night uh, the, the wife called and she said, Preacher, she said, my husband, he, he's not come home and I've just got a bad feeling about him. He's not come home and Preacher, I, I'm afraid he's done slipped up and he's in the bar. And my dad said, what bar is it? She said, it's so-and-so's bar down the road. And dad, she said, preacher, what are we going to do? And he said, well, I'll drive by and see if I see his truck. So dad went by. It was real late at night. And dad went by, and sure enough, he, he went by the first time, didn't see his truck, but he went by the second time. And when he went by the second time, he saw behind the bar there his truck was. So he knew what he was doing. He was pulling behind the bar so nobody could see him. He went, and he said, well, what do I do? So he called, he called that woman, uh, the man's wife, and he said, uh, sure enough, he's here. And she said, preacher, this is awful. She said, I'm embarrassed. I'm trying to live for God and my husband. I thought he was doing right and he's out drinking tonight. And preacher, I don't know what to do. And dad said, well, there's only one thing you can do. He said, I'm going in after him. I'm going in after him. And this is way back a long time ago. Well, it was real late at night, 30, 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm not saying this is what I would do, but only my dad could do this. He walks in the bar, shirt and tie on, white shirt tie, cowboy boots on, leather jacket. Walks in the bar and he goes right to the bartender. He says, have you seen so-and-so? I ain't seen him. He said, have you seen so-and-so? His truck's outside. I haven't seen him. He turns around and he stands up on a little bench. He says, hey! Can I have everybody's attention in here? I'm looking for so-and-so. And the bar clears out. There was people running, tripping over stuff, falling out, running out the back door. And he said literally in just a minute, it was just him, the bartender, and there a man sitting in a corner. And he walks over there and sure enough he looks and there's that man he'd been looking for. He said, what are you doing in here? That man started crying. He said, Preacher, I'm just having a tough time. And he said, I've wanted some alcohol so bad here lately and I thought I could come in here uh, tonight and, and I could uh, just hide it away and, and, and hide it from my wife. He said, no, your wife loves you and cares about you. Your preacher cares about you. Get out of here. And that guy walked out of there and listened, as far as I know, never went back. Folks, let me just tell you right now, uh, if Facebook would have been existed that day, my dad probably wouldn't have been pastoring that church much later. People said the preacher went to a bar. Hey, uh, listen folks, today we live in, a, in an age where everybody is speculating, everybody is accusing, everybody is, is just wanting somebody to fall. Hey, let me just tell you, you better be careful. There's a testimony at stake. Hey, he says holily, he said justly, he said unblameably, and then he said this is how we behaved ourselves among you. Can I tell you tonight the world's watching? The world's watching. The world's watching you, and the world sure is watching me. For every one preacher that slips up, no matter what denomination, there's thousands of people saying, yeah, them preachers. And you know, these televangelists and all these ones on TV, when they mess up, it hurts us all. Because then everybody lumps all them preachers together and they've given Jesus a black eye when really they themselves was not real. Hey, we need a revival of just being real and being godly. And then he says, I like what the Bible says in Acts 24, 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. You know, is there any offenses in here tonight against one another? Isn't it sad that we'll go to churches and try to have revival when this brother over here ain't talking to that one over here? Folks, God cannot speak to a church when the congregation's at, at, at each other's throat. Live in any old way and fighting and quarreling. And by the way, is there some of you sitting in here tonight that you'll go home together, but yet you're not speaking to each other? Fighting? 
Hey, you expect revival to hit your home? You expect revival to hit you individually? Get your offenses right. Hey, make it right tonight. Hey, come down an altar together and say, Hey, we are a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we're not right, the world's watching. The world's watching. They're watching how we behave toward one another. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit and in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. How do we get the gospel to this world? We come together. There is no church that has division in it that's getting anything done for God. So how do we do that? We overcome our offenses. We overcome things. Hey, then I want you to look, notice verse number 11. Look at the, the First Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 11. As we know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Hey, notice that word exhorted. It carries the idea of encouraging and walking alongside of. Notice that Paul ties the word comforted into his dealings with people. Right here, a lot of people cannot be leaders. They simply fail in the matter of exhortation. Do you understand when we exhort somebody, we're literally walking alongside of them, encouraging them to do what's right. I'll tell you, it's, it's one thing to be a leader. It's another thing to stand over somebody and browbeat. There's a lot of churches all over this country that their preacher does nothing but beat up on the people. If you don't come dressed a certain way, you're not welcome here. You must be not right with God. If, if you don't do this, you're not right with God. If you don't do that, you're not right with God. If you don't do this, and they don't show you how to live, they don't walk beside you encouraging you, all they ever do, and excuse me for saying this, is scream at you. Let me just tell you right now, that is not exhortation. I cannot see Christ doing that. I sure can't see Paul doing that. I can't see the disciples doing that. All I can see is someone... Exo I can see Christ encouraging. I can see Paul saying, Hey, you can do it. You can make it. Hey, you can go. Put one step in front of the other. Hey, do it. And I can see Paul exhorting and encouraging. A lot of preachers today are enforcers rather than exhorters. Don't do something because of me. <clears throat> that ain't going to last. Don't come out here Saturday at 10 o'clock to impress the preacher. That will last for about a month. That'll get old. Because impressing me, it, it's just not that big of a deal. Don't dress a certain way to impress somebody. You should dress to impress the Lord. Don't teach a certain way to impress somebody. You should impress or teach in, to impress the Lord. Pleasing to the Lord. Pre my preaching is not just to get a... I, I don't want to get a pat on the back or a pro preacher. Oh, it's so... Oh, the preaching... No, 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 no. All that's fine and all that... I know you're what you're trying to do. But folks, that's not why I preach. I preach to please one, and that's the Lord. Hey, we ought to do things and do it for the Lord. You ought to sing for the Lord. Hey, we ought to uh, teach for the Lord. Hey, notice that Paul ties the word comforted into dealing with people. Hey, you know what part of, uh, really, a, a lot of pastoring is? Pastoring, a lot of it, people think that the preaching ministry is the most important part of the pastoring ministry, but that's not true. The preaching ministry is what I enjoy. I love to preach. I mean, I love it. But that's not the most important part. The most important part of it is exhortation. Where I get down to where you are and encourage you and comfort you and be there when you're at your lowest and be there when you're at your highest. It's a shepherd. Preaching comes a dime a dozen. Folks, if you thought Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday was dynamic preaching, and it was, there's preachers all over this country that I could bring in, and you, you, it would just, it would, you would be amazed. There is great preaching across this country today, but there's very few great pastors. 
because many of them want elevated and it's almost that they use their people as a stepping stool to elevate their ministry. Pastoring is comforting. Pastoring is instead of enforcing, it's exhorting. Paul, notice he reminds them how he charged every one of you. In, uh, in, in, in Thessalonians, he says, As a father doth his children speaking the truth in love. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 15. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. Notice that word, patient. Notice that. You, you, I know you're not turned there, but listen to it again. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. And one of the Paul's uh, requalifying requirement of those that lead people, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. There's, there's people sitting in here tonight that you, you're chomping at the bit to lead, but are you gentle with all men? There's a lot of men across this country that would love to pastor a church. They sit in a pew and they just salivate at the fact that, oh, I'd like to be right there where he's at. But you can't handle people. They irritate you. You're smart aleck with them. It don't go your way, you snap at people. You're hateful. If you're a hateful individual, you'll never pastor a successful church. Some of you need to work on your demeanor. Some of you can dish it out, but you can't take it. It's quiet. You're good at dishing it, but if somebody ever comes back at you a little quirky, you're running to the preacher. I don't know what's wrong. What did I do? Probably your demeanor. Leading people is biting your tongue. really is. Leading people is sometimes letting them say things and you're like walking away saying, man, mm, that hurt, but I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I've watched preachers literally get talked to like dogs and not say a word. Now their wife and the family goes through it because it hurts them. But I've watched preachers walk through the fire at what ugly things people said and they never opened their mouth. And God continued to bless that man because he kept his mouth shut. We're so, we're so quick to come back at a church member, at somebody in the community, or even a mayor, or even a commissioner that, that maybe signs an ordinance or says or doesn't approve your building permit, and you come, oh, bless God, I'll fight him in the parking lot. Well, you done ruined your testimony. That's, that's really what Christ would do. He'd deck a guy for not proving his building permit. I'll meet you out in the street. That's not what Christ would do. How about we just keep our mouth shut? When criticism comes, we just say, you know what, I'll pray for him, but I ain't, I'm not going to open my mouth and start World War III. Why? Because critics are going to... Listen, critics are a dime a dozen. They're going to say things, ugly things, mean things, hateful things. Hey, they're going to message you and text you and call you and criticize you. Hey, what are you going to do? You're going to be gentle, apt to teach, patient. A father who constantly screams at the kids but never takes them out for ice cream. A husband who already berates his his wife, and just constantly downs her and constantly downs her and tells her what she hasn't done right and, and constantly just criticizes and humiliates and never tells her that she's pretty, never tells her that she's done a good job. Hey, you are not patient and you're certainly not compassionate. Never. Listen, folks, if we're going to make a difference, we're going to have to be gentle, patient, these kids that come in on the bus, gentle, apt to teach, patient. I mean, do we really expect them to come in and sit on their, their seat the whole time? 
Do we really expect that? After all the cussings and the screamings and the hittings and the fightings and, the, and all the violence that they've watched on television, experienced at school, and then they come in, we got them for two hours, and we expect them to sit there like wooden Indians? Folks, we're going to have blow-ups every now and then. Gentle. Patient. If you love them, you'd be surprised what would happen. Apt to teach. Hey, we see consolation. Hey, you know what we ought to do, junior church preacher? You are just as important as anybody on this property because you get a chance to exhort one of these children or one of these teenagers that I... Hey, I, I got on to them last Wednesday night a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that when they're texting and running out answering phones and all that. I mean, th there needs to be decency in the house of God. But these, these teenagers that's coming knows I love them. Man, we've started vans. We, we're going the extra mile trying to get stuff ready for them. And we've got more teenagers coming now than... Well, I, I, can't, I mean, it's, it's amazing what God's doing. But can I say, hey... Folks, listen, we need to walk beside of them and exhort them and encourage them to do right. Amen. Have patience with them. Be gentle. Why? Because somebody was the same way with you. Hey, the same way with you. Hey, we have consolation. We, we have conviction. And then we have the challenge. And I'll end with this, the challenge. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 12. That ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto His kingdom and Glory. Hey, notice that word worthy. It comes from the word that means to balance the scales. What Paul is saying here is you live according to these principles, your life will balance with your lips. Notice the word walk speaks of lifestyle. Walk is used in the Bible to speak of walking in the newness of life. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Walking after the Spirit in Romans chapter 8 and verse 4. Walking in honesty in Romans chapter 13 and verse 13. Walking by faith in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7. Walking in love in Ephesians 5 2. And walking in wisdom, Colossians chapter 4. And the Bible talks about walking quite a bit. But guess what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to walk worthy of God. And, and, and church, your walk should match your talk. A lot of people talk about how much they love God, but their walk is not evidence of their talk. We talk about how we want to see souls saved, but you never tell nobody. You always come up... You know what the major thing today... Uh, you know, we, we, we find excuses for everything. Preacher, I love souls to see them saved, but... Some of you just need to take that out of your... and just, just tear it out of your dictionary and just excuses. You'll find them everywhere you turn. I just don't have time. Make sure your walk is matching up with your lip service. Got a lot of... Boy, people, if you would just hang around people, you'd think they were the second coming of John the Baptist. You would think they know more Scripture than anybody. And that, oh man, this guy's a great Christian. But you follow him around a little bit, you would find different. Why? Because their, their talk ain't matching up with their walk. And before you know it, you've got a, what, what the world calls a hypocrite. And you know what they have a right to? If you're not living according to the way you're talking, they have every right to call you a hypocrite. Folks, we need, listen, we need to get back to just good old-fashioned getting in love with God and literally uh, not talking as much as we're walking and walking with Christ, walking and following in His footsteps, hey, leading souls to Christ. Hey, and don't talk about it if you're not going to do it. Now listen, I'm striving as a pastor to, to see this church become a soul-winning church. Some of you just, when I say the word soul win and you cringe because it cost you a little bit on Saturday morning. But you know what? In the grand scheme of things, and I'm patient, folks. If, you, if some of you never, if I never see you on Saturday, I still love you and I'm your pastor. I realize not everybody's able. 
And I realized that being a soul winner is just not a Saturday morning thing, it's a lifestyle. Being a soul winner Monday through Sunday. But folks, if you've got the opportunity to go out as a collective group and encourage one another, me and Brother Toby, like I said yesterday, we went out, uh, Brother Jacob and, 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 and Brother Mike and some of these men got in a van and we just jumped, filled the van up and uh, Brother Wes and, and some other guys were out there. can't remember all the men that was out there. We filled up a church van, drove to a community, knocked some streets out for the glory of God and had a time while we were doing it. Now, we were not just talking about soul winning. We were actually walking. There's a lot more to this. Hey, if you're going to stand up before those kids and teach the Word of God, how about living it Monday through Saturday? Don't stand up in front of my kids and teach them in Sunday school when you're out here doing things you shouldn't be doing. My little girl's watching you and she thinks the world of you and she's putting you up here saying, oh, that's my Sunday school teacher. And then one day finds out that you're living an awful, I'm talking disgraceful life to God. I mean, you are living a wicked lifestyle and you're over here trying to have one foot in the church and another foot in the world and you're, you're, you're almost soothing your conscience to be a Sunday school teacher. Folks, that is an office in the church. Do you understand teaching these kids is not just a, uh, oh, well, we're just going to throw somebody over there. If you're not willing to live by the book, then won't you just say, preacher, I'm not, I probably shouldn't be doing that because my talk ain't matching up with my walk. Now listen, I'm not saying this. You can blame the Apostle Paul. Are you wor walking worthy of God? I have to ask myself that question every day day the pastor of this church is he walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called it's a big deal may I not disgrace the name of the Lord may I be fervent in my walk with God because the world is watching the world is watching